welcome everybody <laughs> for this training uh, this morning. So um, we will introduce us with few few sentences um, before begin uh, the, the training uh, itself. So Matthias Arnold is a Nistogen art historian. Uh, by training, but he has worked for many years in the digital amenities of the Aldeba Center for Transcultural Studies at Heidelberg University. And in 2020, he joined the NFD I for Culture team at Heidelberg University Library. Um, we have Cécile. Cécile Aren is data librarian at Sorbonne University Library, where she is the head of the research data and digital humanities mission since 2019. Uh, she works in academics libraries since 13 years, and before joining Sorbonne University, she worked at, uh, as a, a librarian in the dentistry library of University of Paris, and she was already in charge of the research data for the libraries. She is currently responsible uh, at the library of Sorbonne University. And me, uh, Océane Valencia, um, I'm uh, an archivist <laughs> since 10 years, and now I'm the head of the archive and records department uh, at Sorbonne University since 2016. Mm. And uh, I'm working to um, research data <laughs> since long time. So, uh, the libraries with uh, for your plus training, if it works. Um, organized training session each year, and uh, this year we'll do it uh, within the framework of for your plus universities, and it's focused on open science. So today we'll talk about humanities and fair data. <laughs> so, <laughs> to begin, um, we, we will introduce uh, digital humanities and research data, then um, some words about the research data life cycle, and after we will focus on fair data in the digital humanities, and uh, we will present you some selected tools and good practice examples. There are only examples. We can not show you all of the diversities of the <laughs> Digital Humanities project. <laughs> First, what are Digital Humanities? Uh, it's a transdisciplinary field of research and teaching. Uh, it's not a disciplinary explicit. It's a compilation of methods and tools and use, uh, and it's developed uh, methods and practices to enhance uh, humanities. So digital humanities project work with the digital or digitized corpora, such as data from image or text. Uh, they use digital tools to analyze this data. Yes, we have many definitions. Sorry, the, the slide uh, went too far. Uh, you have a website where you can uh, generate one definition of, by click. Uh, you can try it. It's very fun to see how diverse could be the, the definition. So since it's a set of methods, and discipline. There are many, many definitions, uh, and uh, you have some good examples. Uh, so you have each researcher as his own definition. Uh, you have digital humanities is a subset of humanities scholarship concerned with the historical and prospective influences of technology on human nature. You have uh, it's a name claimed by a community, <laughs> etc., etc. So what's the link between digital humanities and research data? Uh, DH project can be distinguished in several types of projects. We have the DH project 
which reuse data, like digital archive as data, text file extracted from corpus of text by OCR or TV, text mining, digitized manuscript transcription, geospatial data, oral history, archival metadata, etc., etc. You have also the H project, which produce data like database, data visualization, interactive maps, timeline. Uh, so the field of digital amenity is very big. Um, we, we can't uh, talk about each disciplinary and projects today, but we will try to, to show what you could do <laughs> with your with your data in humanities. Sometimes we heard that. In humanities, you don't produce data. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> you have many, many data. You have metadata, you have tracks of text, you have images, sounds. Um, you have many data on your computer, <laughs> even if you are not uh, in uh, mathematics or physical studies. <laughs> So we now uh, we are now talking about uh, research data data life cycle. So um, they, uh, all the types uh, of data we have uh, just uh, seen um, uh, will be uh, used through the, the project to try to identify the main stages of uh, data in a project. We we speak to, we speak about uh, data life cycle, if I can. Yes, great. Uh, so to try to, to identify the main uh, stages of data management uh, of data management in, in the project, we speak of a data life cycle. Uh, the first stage in, uh, is, of course, the one where we, we plan the project and identify the corpus we are going to use and the outcomes we plan to, to produce. Then there is a, a, a second stage of data collection and analysis using specialized tools. And we will see some examples in a moment. Uh, all the data collected must be stored and preserved to avoid the risk of data loss. It's necessary to make regular backups to, and to consider robust and reliable uh, storage and archiving tools, such as those offered by institutions. All the data collected must be stored and preserved to avoid the risk. Um, sorry, it finally comes to the phase of publishing and sharing data. Before sharing, it's necessary to think about uh, which data is relevant for sharing and which will not be shared but need to be archived. It's necessary to sort out the data. If this stage uh, has been prepared in advance, a lot of time is saved for sharing the data then. Uh, some projects collect or produce, uh, produce confidential data, such as personal data from interviews or survey, which will not shared unless it is anonymized. And uh, then the, la the last step will allow others to discover and eventually reuse our data. Uh, in the second image on the right side of the, the screen, uh, you see um, another uh, image of uh, data life cycle, which is more uh, realistic. We see uh, that this cycle is um, often more uh, iterative. It's, um, you have a collection and analysis phase. Uh, stage, which pure, produce partial results, often generates a new collection and analysis phase to complete the first hypoth hypothesis. Uh, so we can uh, have an example uh, on the next slide, uh, Osen, please. Great. Um, here is an example for archaeology. In the first stage, they choose pl to plan to write the data management plan, which will allow them to have a guide to the practice and the whole of the whole team for data management. We had a training course on the data management plan. You can find the, the material on the 4E Plus website page uh, of these trainings or on the Nodo. Uh, during the data creation phase, they structure and describe them with metadata. As you can see, this work is done very early on. They also assign a GOI for each created data. Then they transcribe the field notebooks to complete the data, add keywords from standardized vocabularies, and clean up the resulting data sets. 
during uh, the analysis phase, uh, they enrich the data and do mapping in their, uh, if there are uh, vocabularies or concepts from different ontologies. Then they plan uh, the long-term archiving to, of the data, which is fundamental uh, in archaeology. At the time of the sharing stage, they work on the uh, geolocation of the data. <clears throat> uh, in order for the data to be reused, they assign uh, open li licenses such as Creative Commons and they link the datasets produced to their published articles with their DOIs. All of the work uh, allows them to create data uh, that is compliant with FAIR principles. Uh, the data is findable because of uh, its DOI, uh, it's accessible because it's accurate, accurately described it. And it's interoperable uh, because they have used some of these uh, vocabularies. Finally, the data is reusable because they, are, they have an open license. We are going uh, now to review the FAIR principle uh, in detail with, uh, with Matthias. Right. Now, can we try? Yeah, I should be able to control now. Do I have the control? Hello, everybody. This is from my side. Let's see if that works. Now it does. So now in this section, uh, I will talk about uh, the fair data in the digital humanities. Uh, and uh, to many of you, this will be just a recap because uh, there was a detailed introduction session called Research Data Management, Introduction to Fair and Open Data. It's out just some weeks ago. Um, you will find here all the 15 FAIR principles listed again, and just to name them, so uh, in the findable section, so F-A-I-R is FAIR principles, F for findable, so that mainly consists of, uh, or that mainly means uh, uh, persistent identifiers have to be in the metadata, have to be in the data, the metadata has to be enriched, and it has to be stored in uh, repositories which have indexes and can be accessed there and can be found there. The accessible section means that you need to use in your data, uh, in your data, uh, make use of standard communication protocols uh, uh, like open APIs or things. Uh, these should follow free protocols that should also be open. Uh, in it does not mean that uh, in certain contexts you don't need to have uh, to get a license for things, but this is still fine uh, as long as the metadata is always accessible and available. Then the interoperable uh, uh, section that me uh, uh, it says mainly you need uh, to use vocabularies, controlled vocabularies with your data, and uh, ideally or actually necessarily these vocabularies should also be fair. So don't invent your own, but use uh, authoritative uh, uh, vocabularies, their controlled vocabularies. And you should link your metadata by uh, using these identifiers uh, to all the entities that you are uh, having in your data. And finally, uh, your data should become reusable. That means it should have, uh, the metadata should have multiple attributes. It should be published using a license uh, with, with uh, like a CC license, uh, you should uh, indicate the provenance of your data. That means who did what, uh, who annotated which uh, item uh, in your data. Uh, and you should uh, follow the community standards that depends on the different communities. Um, so let's see, the next slide is here. Yes. So um, since these 15 principles are not uh, self-understandable uh, uh, on their own, uh, uh, the community that published these FAIR principles in 2016 soon uh, found out that they need to clarify a bit more. And you find this paper here by, by uh, Barend Mons and many others uh, who were partially also in, involved in uh, defining the, the principles themselves. So they tried to uh, make it a bit clearer, less cloudy, uh, uh, what that actually means. So uh, they came up with uh, a number of points, and I'm listing four. A, uh, they insisted that FAIR is not a standard. FAIR are principles you should follow. 
you should adapt these principles to your data, but it's not uh, something that is uh, chiseled in stone, you mean, like a, st uh, like a standard. So uh, 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 how to fulfill these can vary. Uh, and the second thing is uh, fair data does not, by definition, mean it's linked data or it's RDF uh, uh, in the semantic web sense. Uh, although they say uh, using semantic data is actually a very nice way to uh, make your data fair, but it does not have to be so. So it's not a must uh, uh, that uh, fair data can only be fair if it is linked data. Uh, thirdly, um, fair data means it's not only fair to humans, but it is also fair to machines. Now, what does that mean? That basically means uh, that you need to open up your data that they can be accessed through computational means like uh, uh, programming APIs, programming interfaces and things uh, so that they can be indexed, that it can be found. Uh, so that is very important. Uh, fair data is not only for humans, but also for machines. Uh, and thirdly, uh, lastly, uh, the last point I'm uh, uh, taking out here is that fair data is not equal to open, but uh, uh, fair data can also be partially, at least, as I said already, uh, can be hidden behind paywalls as long as the data itself is fair. Uh, it does not actually necessarily mean that it's all open access. So, and uh, they made a little chart here uh, after they had a, a little survey uh, and they found out that actually, or they, they yeah, uh, that usually when people are starting doing research and collect data, uh, the outcome of that is that this data is so what they called reuseless. Uh, and they, they, they explicitly want, did not want to say uh, unfair because unfair uh, has a different connotation. So they say uh, uh, their main focus here is that eventually the data is re, uh, can be reused. Uh, so they say if your data rests on your machine, it does not have a, a, a persistent identifier. Uh, it does not have uh, intrinsic metadata, meaning um, uh, for instance, uh, technical metadata attached to images or file information attached to a document, things like that. Or it does not have this provenance stuff, uh, means that this is actually the annotated data, uh, including who did what. Uh, and if the files are just resting on your machine, this is reuse less. So, because nobody can access, nobody can find, nobody can interoperate, nobody can reuse. So that's why it's reuse less data. And they say it's uh, at that point in time, that is five, six years ago, uh, it was about 80% of all research data. So uh, one of the goals of, uh, of today's session is that you understand that data on your machine uh, uh, should not rest there forever, but it should become fair. How to do that? Uh, one is make it findable uh, by uh, uh, providing your data a persistent identifier. Now, you cannot provide a persistent identifier to data that is on your laptop. That's why that implies you need to put it into a repository. Uh, and at, this should at least provide a, pers a persistent identifier so that eter ideally, eternally, uh, your data file can be found through this identifier. Uh, if you then uh, add also metadata, uh, in uh, in the form that is uh, uh, called they call intrinsic metadata like the embedded metadata I, I already mentioned or the provenance data if you add this so you are already on, on state three so that means that at least on the metadata and identifier level uh, your data can be found uh, and then uh, this is already the first these are the first steps towards making your data fairer. Uh, so on the lower part, uh, in the lower part, uh, th uh, they put these types uh, where they say this is actually really fair data, uh, even if the data uh, in chart D, D like Dora uh, is still behind uh, 
some walls, pay walls or uh, time walls or, or uh, other licensing uh, walls. But as long as the data uh, itself is fair, once these walls fall down or tear down, uh, uh, this is all fair. Uh, that it's a good collection. Then the the other version of this is that uh, when you publish it, the data is already uh, accessible through open access. So here you see the difference. The data is open access, but also the metadata and its links and the pers uh, position identifiers have to uh, be added. So that is a fair data open access collection. And if everything is linked to other uh, authorities and other metadata sets, then that is the status F, uh, where it's, it's fair data in open access and with functional links uh, to uh, uh, interlink all the data with other data sets. So these are the three uh, uh, desirable states uh, uh, your data should become or should get to uh, when you want to make it fair. Now, uh, just as an, as an example, uh, um, in archives, uh, uh, you can have uh, fair data because uh, it's at least the fair metadata. So all every archival collection can have uh, a persistent identifier where it is defined. You, you know uh, that archives do not uh, record each individual item they have, so, but they make collections. And as long as the collection is provided with good metadata, uh, uh, both the technical and the content side uh, and gets a position identifier. This is quite uh, a good way to uh, fair data. Even though this data uh, itself uh, is actually analog, right? So uh, uh, on the other side, you have the digitized object and its metadata, which is uh, as long as it's uh, interlinked uh, and, and it's open access, like in this case, uh, you have the ideal fair data collection on, on an institution. Uh, in this case, I think it's from Nakala, which we learn more about later. And as I already said before, uh, as long as the research data is on your machine uh, uh, and nobody knows about this despite of you, this is actually worst case. So uh, if you recollect, uh, reconsider your data uh, uh, and see there are a number of collections that uh, have still this state but should not, then start thinking about how to make them more fair. Uh, let's see if I can advance here. Um, so if you, uh, 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 yeah, now, since the standards uh, are, are already out, or this is fair principles, I'm also saying standards, shame on me. Uh, these five, this, the principles are out since uh, 2016. Uh, uh, and uh, meanwhile, uh, people are wondering how do we evaluate uh, collections, uh, whether or not they are fair. And uh, since we have 15 principles, uh, uh, they came up uh, with a, uh, at the large uh, institution, which is the Research Data Alliance. Uh, they created a working group uh, uh, who was thinking about how to make uh, 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 indicators, how to create indicators, uh, how fair a collection actually is. And so they set up a set of guidelines and made a checklist. And that's what you see here in the data, fair data maturity model. So the fair data maturity model uh, helps you uh, by providing uh, uh, indicators, uh, criteria, uh, uh, helps you to evaluate is that collection you have, is it fair in the sense of, uh, like you can see here, uh, metadata is identified by a persistent identifier, is it yes, no? And how important is it to know that it's actually essential? Uh, the second point uh, on the lower right uh, is the data identified by a persistent identifier, which is also an essential criterion. Uh, and so they do this for uh, a, a lot of uh, sub uh, features uh, and define, is it essential, is it important, or is it just useful? Mm -hmm. uh, and they help you uh, how to assess this information by providing examples and uh, uh, having a assessment details in here. So check it out. The link is down there. Um, I can't do this like this. So how about your own data? 
uh, if you think to do this, uh, if you want to make your own data collection fair, what do you do? Uh, so uh, at first you need to know where to put it actually. And what you need is uh, you need a fair repository because you need persistent identifiers and you and your home machine can't provide these anyway. Uh, so you, you need to identify a fair repository uh, and you need to get in contact with these because they have to agree that, we'll, that they will publish your data and they will have some rules uh, and you need to follow their rules then. Uh, you can help uh, on this way by, uh, from the beginning, using sustainable file formats, using uh, metadata standards. Uh, there are a lot of international metadata standards out there. Uh, and uh, by using controlled vocabularies wherever possible. So wherever you have a name in your data, where you have a date in a data, where you have a place in your data, where you have a look, uh, 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 an institution or an event or so, try to uh, identify these using uh, uh, authorities uh, uh, and link to these. Um, why you then are so now you have identified uh, a, a repository and you're using these formats and you're looking into these so why you continue collecting data continue to double check do your uh, records uh, uh, comply to these uh, rules um, that is one is uh, do they uh, fulfill some kind of minimal requirements. So uh, many collections uh, say there, you should at least give this thing a good title, for instance, right? Uh, uh, or you should make your own minimal requirements by defining, I should at least fill these five fields so th that uh, uh, someone who does not know about the data can still understand it. Uh, next, it's very important, uh, um, whatever you collect, make sure that you can clarify or clear uh, or at least negotiate copyright and licensing of these data. So this, uh, especially for images uh, or uh, the, the more modern you are, the more complicated it gets, uh, but try the best to get these rights clarified because if you want to make something open accessible uh, for others to reuse, you need to be uh, in a state where you can say you are actually allowed to put these things online. And then before you publish the data, uh, double check these rights again, um, and then make your collection uh, uh, identifiable, describe the collection and provide metadata to this and choose a license. So, and uh, there is already a, a number of tools out there. I'm listing one here that's a fair aware tool for a self assessment. So if you have a, a collection, go to this uh, fair aware tool and uh, self-assess if your collection meets those criteria. Yeah, so it's, uh, it has become clear, I think, that the implementation status of FAIR principle depends on a number of things. Uh, and one of these is, of course, the content, uh, because we have the data privacy, copyright, and ethical restrictions aspects you should, you should um, take into consideration. And actually, for these ethical, more uh, 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 ethical restrictions, uh, for the, all those aspects, there is another uh, um, initiative uh, and another rules of principles has been uh, formulated that are called, these are called the care principles. So, especially for uh, 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 anthropology uh, uh, related uh, tasks uh, uh, or many of the cultural his, uh, cultural uh, heritage uh, uh, data uh, uh, have some ethical restrictions uh, implied and there is there are the care principles to, uh, uh, you should look into um, Besides, uh, of course, these, uh, uh, the implementation status of FAIR principle depend on the research subjects. Um, and as uh, we are now talking more about humanities, but uh, in the sciences and life sciences, uh, uh, they are uh, slightly more advanced in this uh, because uh, uh, they have more structured data sometimes. And so they, they are uh, by nature. Um, more uh, looking towards uh, reuse and interchange of data and actually the FAIR principles come from the life sciences. Uh, uh, therefore, 
uh, we can still just notice uh, since you are all here, you are looking forward to do that and humanities can still improve a lot in this regard. Uh, but it's not only the research subject, it's also the geographical regions. So we are here now in the middle of Europe uh, and Europe and Northern America are uh, there at least at a different state compared to other world regions. So uh, the fair data in Southern America or Asia may look differently and we, we get to this in a minute. Uh, and thirdly, uh, or lastly, here on the slide, uh, the activity of the researcher communities very much uh, forms what actually becomes of uh, the data uh, within these communities. So nothing will change if nobody is interested and nothing will change if nobody does anything. So that's why uh, all I say here, uh, all improvements toward more fair data requires constant engagement by the researchers and the communities, which is you. So, uh, uh, and of course, all of us, uh, uh, the presenters as well. Um, we all need to become uh, uh, active in the communities and do something about it if we think there is something we should do. And at least the least thing you, you can do is to publish your data in a fair way. Uh, so uh, I'm coming also from, 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 uh, from, from the East Asian studies. So we, uh, there we, uh, in, in one research project, we made a, a little study where we tried to, uh, because we tried to, to find uh, research material on our subject in China, uh, and we experienced a number of troubles. So we, we, pre, uh, we created uh, a study and tried to do this systematically. It's still under review. So that's why I can't give you a pointer here to an URL. But uh, main, main, main things uh, we found out are uh, fair data is a rare exception, especially uh, in our case, it was in China. So that was rare uh, because often you just you 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 uh, the data is not open, uh, and uh, you need licenses and uh, licensing from inside China and from outside China may differ, uh, and there are large national infrastructure providers uh, like CNKI, the China National Knowledge in uh, Infrastructure, uh, which we which costs a lot of money and there has been uh, recent discussions about the, those costs and large subscribers dropping off and uh, that is, a, uh, is currently a big topic. Um, and even with when you have a paid access to these uh, uh, to the journals or to the resources, then still uh, it's hardly interoperable because you do not get API access uh, and uh, Rarely you get uh, uh, multiple file downloads. You usually do this one by one, and you still have only the article. And uh, getting to the data is even worse, right? Uh, and the publication of data in this case in China, which we studied uh, for re-evolution or even reuse, uh, is still very much in its infancy. That means there are actually three. One, two, three uh, uh, data repositories which provide fair data uh, in whole China. Uh, and one of the reasons there is that uh, many people uh, uh, are still interested in or thinking they can become rich with data. Uh, so commercialization uh, is uh, still a strong thing there. Uh, and only a small number of open access data repositories exist, as I said. Mm. Now, this is a very small, uh, this is a very sp specific use case. Uh, you will know other cases from your own research field. Uh, and uh, to show you the other side, uh, I'm talking now about some examples from Heidelberg University, which, which is where I'm working. Uh, here, we have been uh, active in the recent years to improve the situation. So one is uh, university published a research data policy, which is basically following the guidelines for safeguarding good research practice uh, and a code of conduct published by the German uh, uh, Research Foundation, DFG. Mm. And we founded a competence center for research data 
uh, which takes care of a lot of things uh, uh, for researchers at the university. So they have to do consultation and advice. Uh, they have data management service. They help you sharing. They come. Uh, they commit into data management plans. We have a high performance com high performance computing center. Uh, we have data storage platforms publication platforms where you can publish uh, multimedia objects, research data, and uh, there's also a catalog of all those publications. Partly these were already introduced by Jochen Apel some weeks ago. Uh, for, so for a more detailed introduction, look at the previous sessions, uh, but I just wanted to mention this again here. Um, oops, that was too much. Uh, Yes, so we've seen that. Mm. Sorry for that. Here we go. Yes, sorry for that. Um, yeah, there was also already an introduction of the research data platform, open research data platform we host at Heidelberg, which is uh, uh, called HiData. Uh, uh, based on the Dataverse uh, software. Uh, this is mainly for Heidelberg University members, institutes, research group, individuals, uh, and can even contain lecture series and things like that. But it's also open in, uh, in a way that means uh, Heidelberg hosts uh, uh, or manages uh, a number of so-called specialized information services, in German the Fachinformationsdienste, uh, which are also funded by the German Research Foundation like Art Historicum Net uh, for the arts and uh, uh, especially art history, for Populeum for the classical studies, and uh, quite new is the South Asia focus in the uh, uh, special information service Fachinformationsdienst for South Asia. Uh, these data will be published in, uh, in this repository, HiData, uh, as fair as we can do. And um, now for that one, uh, and uh, in Heidelberg, there's the, uh, the idea to make, uh, to embed all these services into a larger infrastructure. So the larger infrastructure is called Heidelberg Research Infrastructure or HiRIS in German, uh, uh, which is still under construction, uh, but many of these uh, pillars here in this model uh, already exist. So we have a publishing platform uh, uh, for uh, digitizing, the publishing for uh, of eprints, books, and journals. Uh, we have a semantic publishing uh, platform called Whiskey. I'm talking about this later in a minute. Uh, I already mentioned the uh, multimedia repository or object multi uh, repository uh, hide icon, which is. A, uh, uh, yeah, kind of an image database, a uh, multimedia database, and we have the research data platform. And these are all resting on a, on a structure where uh, these items get DOIs. Uh, they can be annotated. There's uh, an additions module and a full text search. And this is all uh, soon be uh, uh, sustained uh, by the uh, still work in progress, long-term preservation platform called High Archive uh, at the bottom, making the foundation for these structures. Mm. So, right. Uh, so far for an overview here, I'm not sure. Uh, am I supposed to go on? Um, no, so I don't think so. <laughs> so, uh, we are going now to see uh, selected tools and uh, good practices uh, examples. Uh, first, we 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 have a, a short video to 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 show you uh, for for this, but uh, just. Uh, just before uh, to talk about linked open data, linked open data is a way of publishing structured data that allows metadata to be connected and enriched so that different uh, representations uh, of the same content can be found and links may be uh, made uh, between uh, related resources. Uh, Ocean, I uh, let you uh, control the...
Uh, you're muted. We don't have a sound. I think you should unmute us, yeah. Now we can't hear it. I don't know if the last try. <laughs> Linked open data. What is it? Why is it good for you as a memory organization? Put yourself in your user's shoes. Say you want to find out about that painting of Venus standing on a shell. You probably search on the word Venus. You'll get lots of results. Venus, Venus, Venus. And after a while, you finally reach the right Venus on an individual website. But what if the web service could help you from the start? First, by disambiguating your search, and then by connecting all kinds of relevant information, updated dynamically within the same web space. Well, linked open data makes this possible. Here's how. Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, asked us to put our information as documents on the web, and so we did. Lots of information today is available on lots of individual websites. And then he saw the next step forward. He asked us to put our information on the web as raw data, because raw data can be linked to other data. That generates connections for the user and puts them in touch with a much richer network of information. But to make that happen, you've got to do four things. Um. So linked up open data is uh, linked uh, data that um, are open data. Tim Berners-Lee gives the clear, clearest uh, definition of linked open data in a differentiation with elicited data. Uh, linked open data is uh, linked data which is related under an open license, which does not impede its reuse for free. Uh, and uh, Jim Pernos Lee has suggested uh, a five-star shame for grading the quality of open data on the web, for which the highest ranking is linked open data. So if you, um, if you have one star, uh, your data is openly ava available in some format, but uh, two-star data is available in a structured format, such as uh, Excel file format, for example. Uh, so, uh, three stars uh, data is available in non proprietary structure formats such as CSV, uh, and four stars da data follows uh, W3C standards like using RDF uh, and applying uh, URE. And five star, uh, all of the other uh, plus links uh, to other linked open data sources. Um, so uh, then uh, we we are going to 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 see uh, other um, other examples of tools. I, I can't uh, uh, use the, the button for the slides. And sorry, I if you you can great. Um, so uh, for Daria, Daria um, is a, a network that aims to improve and ensure digital support for research and teaching in the arts uh, and humanities. It's a transdisciplinary uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, on Daria, you have a selection of repositories uh, that is proposed, as well as vocabularies uh, adapted to the humanities. Uh, Daria also offers a kit to help to standardize uh, the metadata, and the tools to process and analyze data are proposed. Uh, finally, a specialist search engine uh, has been created. Next slide, please. Um, 
then uh, we have another example uh, that is Clarin. Clarin uh, is uh, an inf a European infrastructure for language data. Uh, the objective uh, of this uh, infrastructure is to support the sharing, using, and processing of language data with the suit of adaptive tools. Uh, the language resource switch board allows discovering, exploiting, annotating, analyzing, and combining data sets. And there is also a virtual language observatory to access uh, digital data. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and uh, another example uh, it's, uh, is Opera. Opera will be um, a European research infrastructure for open scholarly uh, communication particularly in the social science and humanities. Uh, it's led by the French Open Editions. It aims to become an ERIC and groups uh, 35 organizations for two European countries. Um, and uh, Opera pro, uh, provides joint services, mutually activities of strategic scholarly communications, uh, actors and stakeholders in their transition to open science. Uh, Opera develops a common good practice standards for digital open access publishing, infrastructure, service, services, editorial qualities, business models, and funding streams. Um, Opera explores an alternative measurement of impact in the um, uh, social science and humanities, and Opera offers sustained training along the common standards to researchers and uh, other stakeholders on all of, of the above. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, you, you can, uh, you already uh, know perhaps uh, this one, uh, Zenodo is a general purpose re open repository developed uh, within European uh, open air program and operated by, uh, by CERN. Uh, each submission is assigned a persistent digital object identifier, a DOI, for easy citation. If you deposit several versions of the same data set, each version uh, will have a DOI and will be able to refer specifically uh, to one or the other. If you created an other ID, such as an archive, you, be, you will be able to link your data set to, the, to your other ID, as well as uh, to your articles. If you want to look uh, at, uh, at uh, examples, you can uh, find us uh, on uh, ORCID. And uh, I let the floor to, uh, to send for email. Yes, I will make a little focus about uh, the French infrastructure, Emmanuel, uh, which is dedicated to digital humanities. Um, all French researchers can benefit from human services free of charge. It's important to notice. Um, <coughs> Human goals uh, is to support research community by providing services, assessment, and tools on digital research data. Uh, they have, have launched a thematic consortia, uh, which are working group for researcher and engineer. You have about um, sounds, uh, ethnology, um, photography, etc. And one of the scientific objectives of such involvement is to promote data sharing so that other researchers, communities, or disciplines can reuse them, uh, including from an interdisciplinary perspective. More generally, human services are based on, uh, on the principle and method of link open data, as you can see earlier. Uh, this principle allows data to be documented for many future use. Uh, data are too often confined and inaccessible, and with human tools, uh, data becomes accessible and reusable. All of the services of human follow the data life cycle and comply with the FAIR principle. So we have a set of services uh, with specialized humanities search engine, Isidore, uh, for existing data. You can find a cloud for working team on project. Uh, you have a text editor, Stilo, you have a control tool, uh, a project management tool. 
um, you can find all the panels, uh, all the services on their website. And we make a little focus on Nakara, which is a data repository for humanities. Uh, it's interoperable and uh, a secure data repository for all type of data. So you can share uh, and upload files, text files, audio, video, image, uh, or what you want. Um, the repository assigns a PID and guarantees permanent access to the data. Uh, earlier, we, we made a slide with uh, an example which is stored on Nakara. Uh, you can find many, many, many data on this, of, on this repository, and you have a certain join uh, to allow you to search for the data set. Nakala, on Nakala, the data can be deposited and exposed or not. Um, and if you want, you can um, use the Nakala Press tool to, public, to, to publicate uh, your data on your website if you want. Uh, and it's interoperable, so you can do what you want uh, on your data or on Nakala. <laughs> Yes. Right. Um, so uh, we already showed you uh, a, a number of these large European infrastructures and uh, had just seen French infrastructures. And in Germany, uh, there is currently a, a, a very big uh, initiative going on that is the uh, German National Research Data Infrastructure or NFDI. Uh, this has been launched uh, some two years before. Uh, and this aims uh, at uh, managing, uh, systematically managing the scientific and uh, research data within all the Germans, throughout all Germans' uh, research uh, institutes and researchers and uh, uh, interest groups and associations. So, the, including uh, the provision of long term storage, backup, and accessibility in terms of the fair service. Uh, and uh, creating up a creating a network, both nationally and internationally. Um, this is still in the making. The NFDI is still going on. That means uh, the, uh, we have we, we had two rounds uh, of applications, uh, uh, one each year. Uh, in the two rounds that have been uh, uh, decided upon already. Uh, there are uh, 19 uh, consortia funded. Two of these actually are uh, uh, focusing on the humanities, and I'm listing these on the right uh, at the bottom. That's the NFDI for culture. I'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, and another one, which was agreed on last year, is the Text Plus communities. And actually, later this year, uh, we hope that uh, uh, ideally both of the other uh, tools uh, will be. Uh, uh, allowed to join in, which would be the For Memory uh, uh, um, Consortium and the For Objects con Consortium. Uh, this will be decided by the Joint Science Conference uh, GWK in later in this November, coming November. Um, what do we do here is uh, uh, it is a, an infrastructure for research data. Uh, that includes uh, all kinds of advice, consultation, and guidance, how to deal with uh, research data management. Uh, and this is very, very uh, uh, subject specific or area specific, so to say. Uh, uh, that's why I say we uh, produce service portfolios organized along technical thematic domains. Uh, so that's why the uh, uh, ideally for uh, humanities, um, consortia are already working together and we hope that all four get funded. So uh, I will talk a bit more about the NFDI for culture now. Uh, if I manage to get on, yes. So NFDI for culture uh, focuses on research data on material and immaterial cultural heritage. So these are the tangible and intangible cultural assets uh, 
And this covers uh, a number of uh, uh, research communities, including the architecture, art history, musicology, uh, and goes down to theater, dance, uh, or goes further to uh, dance film and media studies, performance studies. Uh, we have uh, nine co-applicants, and uh, one of these is Heidelberg University, uh, together with 56 participants. These may vary from consortium to uh, consortium, uh, actually very, very lot, uh, uh, very much. Um, in our, this is in our case. Uh, and we have a number of task areas which cover the whole research data lifecycle. Uh, and here you find the web page if you are interested in learning more. Mm. Yeah, so uh, just to name uh, very few uh, uh, things I think are uh, uh, features of the NFDI for culture. One is uh, we have a, a thing that is called uh, the culture help desk, which is already uh, uh, functioning. Uh, where we very welcome uh, researchers from the community to ask us about their problems or ask for solutions or ask questions or ask for help, ask for consulting, for advice, ask for guidance. So uh, the, one of the main addresses is that researchers who are supposed to provide like uh, fair data or who uh, are supposed to make their data uh, uh, collection uh, uh, sustainable, uh, so long-term preservation is uh, another thing here. Uh, so they can use, they can go through this help desk and then they will be helped. Uh, and since we are uh, uh, still developing, so this uh, feedback is actually very important uh, uh, to the whole NFT for culture as is for the other consortia, because we are very much bound to the communities, we we we, we uh, want to react to the questions that the actual researchers do have and do not uh, think about what could be, could be, but uh, but uh, we want to do this on uh, actual needs. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, we are developing, therefore, is to put these in a, a more accessible way. Uh, so all the uh, the information about how to capture data and which data metadata standards uh, uh, we are provide we are we are constructing a collection registry tool registry we are uh, we are focusing on multimodal publications so called enhanced publications uh, uh, and we are still about to define what that actually means. Uh, 3D, uh, audiovisual data, legal data, uh, and so forth. Uh, and all these information is supposed to be uh, part of one, one larger uh, infrastructure that is called the culture knowledge graph, which is a semantic uh, uh, framework where uh, you are supposed to be able to uh, search for all these things and get uh, get the results uh, from all the subparts and task areas and uh, uh, and projects that are all in there. Right. Uh, so this is this will be one of the bigger outcomes of the NFDI for culture, among many others. Uh, we are, uh, I, uh, you see here that uh, uh, the culture help desk, uh, which I already mentioned, uh, uh, is on the main web page as a screenshot from the web page, uh, and you can uh, pre-categorize your inquiries according to the uh, six task areas uh, that we have uh, in the uh, in the consortium uh, that follow the research data lifecycle, plus we have a governance administration thing. So uh, from the data creation to the metadata standards, to the data services, to publication, where Heidelberg is uh, resting, publication and long-term preservation, uh, the, then there is one group for the legal and ethical activities and uh, the data academy, cultural research data academy, uh, for uh, uh, qualification and training. Uh, so you can as, uh, as assign your question to these and then you will be helped, as we say in German. Uh, 
So far for uh, this national initiative, I hope I didn't skip something. No. Okay. Um, now, um, this is now a, a, a little twist in here, but uh, one of these uh, standards uh, uh, you can use in cultural heritage uh, institutions or for uh, your uh, humanities research, especially in the cultural heritage sector, uh, is one thing that's called uh, conceptual reference models, CDOC CRM, uh, that provides you with a structure uh, that you can apply to your information to make it interchangeable and uh, make it uh, uh, towards a standard. Uh, this, uh, the conceptual reference model was developed by the ECOM uh, documentation standards group and since 2006 has become already an, an ISO standard. Uh, and uh, uh, it has a number of uh, uh, models uh, according to certain substandards of data, like for the bibliographic records, the Ferber, or spatiotemporal models, uh, or for social phenomena. So you have a number of these models listed up here. Why am I talking about this? Uh, that is because one of the tools uh, we are providing uh, at Heidelberg and uh, uh, which are also part of the uh, NFDI for culture thing and uh, which we are working on together with a number of partners, for instance, from the German National uh, Museum at Nuremberg, uh, where this software was uh, uh, developed, is the, the thing, a, a tool that, we, that is called Whiskey. Uh, uh, Wissenschaftliche, uh, uh, the scientific communication infrastructure. I'm not talking about the German now. Um, this is interesting because uh, it tries to, uh, uh, no, it does provide a an, 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 an middleware, so to say, uh, to apply your data to, uh, uh, to reference models like the CDOC CRM. Uh, it's based on Drupal. Uh, and uh, implements fair principles, is modular, have, has a web-based uh, editing interface, authority support, uh, and is very useful if you want to produce linked open data, uh, uh, providing REST API, Sparkle endpoint, and things. And one of the main features there is uh, you can uh, use a tool that was created within Whiskey that's called the Path Builder. Uh, uh, which provides you a graphical interface to model uh, the semantic structure of your data. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, this has a strong community, uh, also within NFT Alpha Culture uh, in Nuremberg. It was developed. Art Historicum Net uh, has adopted it. Uh, Heidelberg University Library does it. Uh, and many more in Erlangen, uh, uh, Marburg, München, and uh, many, many more places. Uh, if you want to know more, look at these web addresses, and I'm going to talk a bit more about it. Um, I can. Yes, so uh, the CDOC CRM uh, uh, provides you uh, the framework to model your information. So if you want to uh, uh, encode uh, something like uh, the artist Albrecht Dürer, uh, uh, you need to go through the information character, carrier that was produced by uh, uh, at a production event. And this production was actually carried out by a person which got a name and the name is Albrecht Dürer. Uh, so this information has to be modeled. Uh, the same is if this production was uh, done at a place uh, and this place is also identified by a thing that's called a place name and actually the name is Nuremberg. Yeah, so uh, modeling data according to the semantic uh, uh, way it can be complex uh, and therefore uh, the information, uh, the, the, the whiskey tool uh, uh, helps you with this path builder. You can see here uh, a screenshot of how this uh, looks like. So you have uh, uh, a list of uh, number of uh, uh, entities that have been uh, modeled already and 
as you can see here, uh, these are the two we have been talking about. And uh, the tool provides you uh, with a graphical interface to easily model this thing and uh, always come back and adjust the model uh, 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 if you have to. So this is a very, very um, important feature, I think, uh, uh, that helps uh, people to model their data information in a semantic way. Uh, so it can become fair, uh, and uh, uh, this can easily be reused by others. The whole tool will be uh, reusable, is already reusable. So go to the Whiskey EU page, and there you find uh, Docker containers, and you can install it at home if you want to. Uh, and just to show uh, what to do with the data, then you can output it uh, in very nice ways. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 Whiskey supports IIIF viewer. Here you see a mirror door uh, where you can uh, do further things. You can zoom in images and make annotations. And uh, there's also a GIS interface where you can map your locations uh, uh, and, and plot these to, uh, uh, to a map. And then people can click on these pointers and get to further information. OK, so far from Whiskey. Uh, so uh, here are two uh, final uh, examples of uh, digital humanities projects that are compliant, uh, compliant with the FAIR principles. Uh, Open Archeo is a semantic web platform for archaeological data. Um, an archaeological uh, data model has been uh, implemented. They have created interoperable uh, data set models that are compliant with the linked open data, uh, five star scale and fair principles. Um, there is an article that describes the different stage of the project. The data sets are matched with the CDOC theorem, uh, which Osen has, a, uh, with Matthias, sorry, has already mentioned. Uh, this allows to make uh, heterogeneous uh, archaeological uh, data sets interoperable. All the tools created uh, have been made available to the community. And now Open Archeo offers a user-friendly query uh, interface, uh, the use of an external uh, uh, an API for web services, and a way to explore data from distributed autonomous uh, data providers. Um, and uh, another example uh, is uh, the Lila project, Linking Latin, is a knowledge-based uh, project of linguistic resources for Latin. A fair principle have been applied. Um, the data is findable because uh, each resource and each metadata has a uh, uh, URI, URI. The data is accessible. Uh, there is a, an a HTTP uh, communication protocol uh, is used and Sparkle and RDF uh, are used as a query language. Um, and data is uh, interoperable because there are standard ontologies and vocabularies. For example, uh, linguistic linked open data vocabulary. Uh, and uh, the data, of course, are reusable because they use uh, Creative Commons and uh, GNU license uh, for uh, data sets and for software. Um, and... Uh, at the end, why made fair data uh, for humanities? Uh, here you have some citation for papers with your tools gave the status of the data as the others with data set being extended by 17% per year. Uh, but uh, we could find a working email address for the first, at least, corresponding auto filled by 7% per year. If digital data were, are not preserved for the long term uh, with repository, PID, etc., cetera, um, the risk of disappearing uh, due to the obsolescence of the media formats or software is very high. Uh, so we have a challenge for today's research, which is to preserve our di native digital scientific heritage. <laughs> and then <laughs> I let Matthias conclude our oh, training. 
Right, to wrap up, uh, time is running as usual. Um, we tried to show you today uh, uh, what fair day we hope we were successful to show you how what, what fair data in the humanities mean, it, especially in the digital humanities. We showed you a number of large scale inst uh, infrastructures and uh, uh, smaller infrastructures that might be of interest to you. There are many, many more. Uh, uh, please uh, have a look and we have a bibliography section I come to in a second. Uh, what should you do? Uh, it does not come naturally. Uh, um, which is not a thing specific to the humanities, uh, uh, but uh, you can do something that is uh, publish your data. Uh, that is a surprise now. Uh, and it should be fair published uh, as open as possible. So not just, I know just is, uh, 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 can, is, is debatable, uh, papers and theses and books, but also publish the data. Uh, and We'd like to stress that you should not only publish your interpreted data, but also the raw data it was already mentioned uh, in your research data repositories. Uh, you have no idea what other people may be able to do with your data if you publish this as raw data uh, from complete different uh, research areas. They will be happy if you do that. So do so. Assign free licenses as free as possible in use standards. Um, link your authorities, uh, link your data to authorities, the metadata and the raw data. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, here we have Wikidata Library of Congress subject headings, whatever. Uh, make it national, international standards, uh, uh, or help defining community specific authorities. Um, so uh, eventually, the thing is up to you. Before I open the floor, uh, engage in your community and collaborate and be fair. So, uh, and I will introduce the bibliography shortly and then we can open up. So, we have put a number of uh, uh, resources about digital humanities mostly in the upper section and uh, some pointers to the fair data principles uh, in the lower section. Uh, and uh, the last thing uh, we should do here is announce that there will be further further sessions in the whole series. So please keep this in mind. Uh, we will publish the slides uh, online and the recording will also be published. And uh, now we perhaps we just open the floor to your questions in the chat. Uh, please provide your session so your questions in the chat and we will read them out for all. Uh, and try to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, already uh, three questions uh, in the chat. Uh, first one, is there um, a or multiple, uh, multiple software stack that supports end-to-end -end fair data management? Do you have any examples of uh, implementations in university or other organization of uh, software for fair man uh, data management? Matthias, perhaps in uh, Edelberg, <laughs> you are in, in advance with uh, with tools for uh, data uh, for fair data. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what is actually meant. I mean, uh, uh, there's no uh, thing I know of where you put your data in and it eventually it becomes fair. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, uh, data that needs mm, annotations, uh, uh, as we mentioned, uh, links. Uh, to be added to make this fair. The repositories uh, we are using in Heidelberg are, uh, uh, are specific. So we have uh, uh, this multimedia uh, database I mentioned, uh, Hide uh, Icon, which is for images and video and uh, visual information, 3D models like this. And we have uh, uh, a more, uh, I think, more focusing on uh, raw and uh, uh, interpreted um, data output. That is the high data platform. This is actually based on the Dataverse, uh, which is um, a software that was uh, uh, developed by Harvard uh, and has become one of the platforms uh, that can be used uh, uh, for publishing research data. 
Um, uh, I don't know if that answers a bit of the question. Um, another question is uh, what about uh, methods uh, that, uh, that uh, have been used, for example, in uh, SPSS analysis or methods uh, used to extract features from text? Are these also part of fair data? You want me to answer? Uh, um. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, all kinds of data can become fair, no matter if it SPSS, if it is your interview data, if it is uh, your image collection, if it what not, uh, as long as you follow the principles uh, in annotating them and publishing them, right? So yes, uh, uh, SPSS data can become fair if you publish it, uh, uh, in a specific format, uh, uh, reusable format on a data repository platform, uh, provide uh, uh, metadata, provide links to it, uh, and uh, open it up with a license. So then, yes. So, and basically, uh, all uh, of those who are here in the sessions provide, uh, uh, have their own data, and all of these data sets can be made fair and should. And uh, a last question for, uh, for you, Matthias, is uh, could you repeat the name of the software used uh, in uh, Edelberg? <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure which one you meant. Uh, uh, we use a lot of uh, yeah. uh, database platforms because we don't think there is one fits all. Uh, so we think it's better to use specialized uh, software systems for special things and interconnect them, um, which unfortunately is not the, the most easy way to do it. However, it works very well. And uh, for the uh, uh, image collection, we're using EasyDB uh, in version 5, coming 6, coming soon. Uh, for the data uh, uh, repository, as I said, we use Dataverse um, and um, what else? We use Whiskey, which is Whiskey. Yeah. If you have further questions, uh, I mean, you can also uh, direct message me if you don't want to know more. I think Stavros is very active here in asking questions, so you're very welcome to uh, uh, contact me later. So uh, I don't see other question uh, in the chat, but if you if you have one one last question or two last questions, well, there are many more. So, uh, shall, do we have time? Yes, we have. Yes, yes. Uh, feel free. Um, will it be possible to get this presentation by email to all the participants? Uh, no, we don't do this by email because uh, uh, the email server will not be happy about this. Uh, but we publish these things on the website, uh, and perhaps one can put the link to the website in the chat again, and these will be uh, eventually on the Nodo, right? Ah, and there already was an answer that uh, these things will be on the Nodo. Um, so the so Harvard we have uh, the name of dangerous. Harvard software, but uh, yeah. Carolina uh, answered. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, and then uh, I don't see the question. So so any more questions? Go ahead. We still have five minutes if you want. Yes, I have a question. Hello. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for the information. It, it was really very useful. Um, I don't call myself a, a literate person in this area. I'm uh, coming from the literature and philosophy background. So I was wondering uh, also from an educational perspective, um, also, my question is probably very basic uh, compared to the knowledge that you were communicating. So um, 
as a teacher, I was always very um, uh, concerned about student plagiarism. So do you think that fair science open data in general, does it um, uh, increase the chance of plagiarism or it decreases the chance of plagiarism because it's just like copy pasting everything into your writing. And also um, as the method of research in general, open digital research, I'm always thinking about um, the importance of original thinking. So when we say uh, something is should be reusable or replicable, that always um, rings a bell for me that what about original thinking? What do we think about people having their own um, ideas? Um, of course, uh, you can create something and from there you can open up the science. Uh, but after that, um, it's at the same time, um, you can copy paste something and then um, something starts from there. So as Kierkegaard says, everything is plagiarism at the end of the day. So what, uh, what do you think about that in general? Do you believe that we are building on each other's knowledge or do we have original thinking and critical thinking at all? Um, also, about um, analysis in general, um, is it um, uh, digital? Okay, we are talking about digital data, but are we talking about uh, collecting digital data and then doing a personal analysis or somebody can do an ana analysis for us as well? Because I think students you most of the time are struggling really with analysis and when you give them when you increase the data then the main problem will be who is going to analyze this data okay i i, I uh, collected all this data but what is going to happen then thank you so much uh, whichever of you can answer so, just for to begin, um, not everything needs to be open uh, right away. Uh, you can uh, declare your data, but make them not uh, not make them available immediately. So you can protect your your originality of reflection, etc. Uh, and after with the students, uh, the more reliable and findable are the sources, uh, the less uh, the plagiarism is possible because it's very easy to know uh, where the data and the ID were found. So, and after for the mass of the data, uh, which are supposed to be produced, I, I don't know, <laughs> perhaps Matthias, <laughs> you have an idea? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> No, Cecile. <laughs> yes, Cecile, you want to go first? No. Uh, uh, uh. Yes. So I think um, one always has. Uh, I mean, it's it's your data. You're collecting the data, uh, and before you publish these uh, as fair uh, uh, data, you can decide at what point in time. So if you are provide if you're preparing your PhD thesis uh, and you uh, you should be uh, doing uh, original research, uh, you should not publish everything before you finish your PhD. So um, uh, uh, that said, uh, you can still do smaller parts. Yeah, you can start early. Uh, you can uh, do this data set and that data set and publish it, uh, uh, and then. Uh, reuse this, uh, so to say, in your in your thesis as well. But uh, so the, the main thing is uh, you can decide when and uh, if you find the right point in time, then you should publish it fair, right? Uh, plagiarism is always a problem, of course. Uh, that's why we encourage you to use uh, to apply licenses 
uh, now applying licenses and uh, 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 people uh, uh, following these licenses may, may be two different things. We need to do two things. One is to uh, uh, gain trust in, in the community uh, uh, and provide it with, with trust. And the other thing is we should make sure that uh, it actually is there. So there are many uh, plagiarism uh, checkers out there. Uh, where you can check for uh, reuse of texts uh, 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 in Germany. Uh, the, 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 these were used, uh, uh, for instance, um, with politicians' uh, thesis, and so they double checked where they are doing original research, yes, no. Uh, uh, and so this uh, is part of the rules I introduced by uh, uh, the university library, uh, university actually. Uh, uh, that says uh, one should make sure that uh, uh, research that is uh, uh, a graduation uh, thesis, for instance, is not following plagiarism. So that everything is going to be checked. Actually. Right. But do trust in the community. I mean, uh, uh, um, publish your data and uh, people will know that it's actually your data. If you publish an, uh, an article uh, in connection to that, then you point to the article and this article points to your research data. So whoever claims it was his or hers, uh, uh, you can always say, I published the article and there is it is. And so uh, there you it's, have to prove. it's easy. Uh, I, when you mentioned the Chinese, uh, it's not happening in China, and I understand why. I coming from Middle East, I also know that plagiarism is very strong in the Middle East. You can just have a PhD, plagiarized PhD. So, in that sense, uh, I understand why China is not joining, and I understand why you, Europe is joining because you are talking about trust and the community of researchers, which is a culture. I think it needs to be built first before sharing all this data thank you so much right just to add on uh, in the chinese culture as i tried to uh, uh, point out it is actually changing uh, it, it's not changing as fast as uh, we might wish it should but it, it does change there are public repositories and these are getting uh, used now this is uh, the phase where these things, uh, these things get to get adapted, uh, and as long as we in our research uh, uh, try to make as much use of it as possible, so we we become the role models, uh, and other uh, others will follow. Uh, and in some countries, it may take a bit more time, but. Uh, uh, within Europe, if, uh, if we have the chance and we have the, uh, the context to do so, and that's why we should. Okay, thank you. So we have just uh, one message more in the chat uh, saying, uh, I think that it is possible to work on two different uh, research subjects, uh, starting from uh, this, uh, the, the, the same uh, uh, same data probably. Uh, so yes, <laughs> it's, uh, that's true. You can uh, you can use and reuse um, the the same data set to 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 work on uh, on different uh, research or hypotheses, etc. Um, I, I don't see other question. If we don't have uh, other question, perhaps we can <laughs> we can stop the, the recording and the presentation here. So thank you very much to uh, to you, and um, so thank you. And we, so we, we, you, you can uh, have the, the the material of the training session in your few day uh, on the Nodo and on the website. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Bye.